Hey Winslow, how are you? Doing okay, just kind of fretting because my floodlight quit. So I'm pleased I've got something that doesn't look like total darkness. <laughs> <laughs> so, so where are you calling from? San Francisco. Okay. Um, and, and you're Canadian? You're from Canada originally? or That's, Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. How long have you been in the States then? Uh, more than half my life at this point. Yeah. Do you, yeah. do you still feel Canadian or you, do you feel American now? Uh, I feel Canadian, but I sometimes find myself talking about we uh, as if I'm an American. Uh, <laughs> and I always kind of catch myself and feel a little strange. <laughs> yeah, you want to be careful with that. Yeah. <laughs> so what time is it there? It's 10.02 uh, in the morning. Okay, cool. Well, thank you for, for agreeing to have a chat with me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, no, it's great. Thanks for having me. So um, I, I have a YouTube channel that's mainly lessons, but then I, I do kind of interviews and I've done them for a few years, but I try and get people when they come, come over to the UK generally. But then with, yeah. with the current situation, I thought, well, everyone's stuck at home. So it's a great chance yeah. for me to talk to all my favorite harmonica players that I've never been able to meet over here, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's definitely uh, connected people in new ways. Uh, we had to cancel the spa convention. Yeah. The, the in-person one, but I just got an email from the president this morning and he's saying, okay, here's how we can block out Spa Week online comments, please. So we're, we're starting that process to oh, have a, I mean, obviously some things can't happen, but uh, we can certainly present seminars and, and performances. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Spa, you, so have you been the president in the past? You've been in, in, heavily involved, haven't you? I've been heavily involved for quite some time. I mean, I've been a member for almost almost 30 years, <laughs> time creeps up on you. Um, but I really got involved in running it maybe 15 years ago, something like that. And yeah, I did serve one term as, as president mm -hmm. um, about five years ago. Yeah. Um, and the organization has uh, certainly improved a lot over time. I mean, when I first joined, it was a lot of old timers who were grossing about how there weren't any young people doing what they were doing, mm -hmm. you know? And who are all these blues players making noise? Get them away from us. <laughs> so we changed that. Mm. Good, good. <laughs> it's almost in danger of being too much the other way now. Mm -hmm. you know, because all of the wonderful old harmonica bands and people doing wonderful things with the chromatic and the chord and the bass and all of those things. Mm. Um, and I'm actually in a harmonica band now locally. Wow. One called uh, Tin Sandwich. Not a terribly original name, but... Um, <laughs> And I've been writing arrangements for it. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've got a bass and chord and then two melody instruments. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's been fun. Yeah, I think it was, um, I, I've been speaking to so many people recently, I can't remember who says what, but um, I think it was Rob Paparazzi said to me, there was a point, I don't know how many years ago, that when Spa was kind of, you know, the chromatic guys over in one corner and then a, flu a couple of blues guys in another corner and they didn't want to speak to each other kind of thing. <laughs> it was very much like that. And I, I was somebody who could function in, for some reason, both camps saw me as part of them because <laughs> I play both instruments. Um, and so uh, I didn't feel that divide as sharply as some, uh, some might have done, um, but I saw it nonetheless. You know, I wasn't as much subjected to it as just realizing, gosh, this is going on. and Maybe mm -hmm. we can do something to bring folks together, which, which happened over time. And I was certainly I wasn't the only one doing it. Um, but I was part of that effort, certainly. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you mentioned you play chromatic and diatonic and, and you play them both very well. And, and you're also such a respected teacher. And, um, you know, a good player doesn't always make a good teacher and, and vice versa. And so I think it, it's great that you've got both those things happening. And I have to say, I love the the uh, the dummies books, you know, if I, oh, if I can put it that way. I, I, I kind of like this, the, the series of, of the, you know, X, Y, Z for, for dummies anyway, because I like the way they're done. But, you know, I, I love your books. So I'd love to hear a bit about, well, how, how did that even come about? How did you get get the gig originally? Well, it goes back actually to Rob Paparozzi, mm -hmm. interestingly enough. Mm -hmm. Now, years ago, I mean, a long time ago, I published a, a, a magazine, small scale magazine for harmonica players. So I kind of gotten known as someone with, with some teaching ability from writing those. Um, and also I was on Harp L and a lot of the early discussion forums, which is still going, by the way. 
Um, and uh, the publisher of the Dummies books, Wiley, is um, headquartered in New Jersey where Rob lives. Mm -hmm. And evidently somebody saw one of his gigs and approached him. And he said, well, I'm not the guy. You should talk to Winslow. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> and um, now it wasn't a slam dunk. I had to prove myself to them that I could write something. And it took me a while to kind of really figure out how they operated and what they wanted done in a dummy's book. Hmm. Um, but once we got that going, now they, they have a production schedule, right? I mean, they are not publishing your... Uh, your magnum opus, right? You don't go to a beach in, 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 in Mexico and just write for a year or something like that. Um, you have a four month deadline to produce the entire book, one quarter of the page count each month. And you're responding to editorial queries. It's a very intensive process. But what comes out of that is something that um, follows the dummies pr a principle that the reader is intelligent but knows nothing about the subject. Mm. So you have to answer every question. I mean, I had editors asking me, what's a key? Yeah. I'm like, what do you mean, what's a key? Right? <laughs> I almost mm. got indignant at it. But then I realized, okay, lots of people come to want, they come to wanting to play music from knowing nothing about it. Mm. Right. I mean, if you grow up in a musical household, you know, of course, you know what a key is. But if you one day decide, you know, that you're maybe you're 50 years old, you've never played a musical instrument, you decide, gee, I'd like to play the harmonica. Hmm. And, 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 and I, I encounter this now a lot in my teaching. So you have to be able to answer those questions. On that particular one, uh, I thought, well, may, gee, maybe they answer the question in music theory for dummies. Hmm. And I got the book. Sure enough, they never addressed the question. So I had to come up with a way to do that. But I mean, that's the kind of stuff you really have to respond to the editors um, advocating for the reader, as they call it. Mm. So like I say, it was a very intensive process, but I think what came out of it was was very good. Yeah, I mean, I, I really like that you described it well, um, you know, educated people, but who know nothing of, of the topic. And, and I think, I think, I, I just love that, that concept because we're all dummies, you know, we're all kind of complete novices w with so many things. And, and if you take something up as a hobby, um, you know, you, you're usually starting from absolute scratch. And, it, and it's difficult, I think, if you know a lot about something to remember what you, you know, what you didn't know at one point, you know, remember how yeah. ignorant you were and think, well, I, of course I wouldn't know what a key key is. You know, how would I know what a key is? You know, um, yeah. so, so I really like the series for that. And I, and I think you've done a great job with it. I think um, I th I've got, uh, I should show the good people. I've got uh, Blues Harmonica for Dummies right here. And um, oh, okay. I, I think this is, is, for me, is even more of an achievement than, than just Harmonica for Dummies because... So many people want to learn blues from day one, and it's yeah. so difficult to teach it. Well, I think I think there are problems with teaching it from day one because the sound they want takes so much work, and, and there are yes. there are so many difficulties. So um, maybe could you say something about how you've approached that in in terms of getting people right from the start to be kind of geared towards blues? Well, one of the things I deliberately didn't do, which I did in, in Harmonica for Dummies, was focus on first position melodies in the middle register, right? Mm -hmm. Because the harmonica was designed to play melody in the middle four holes and accompany that melody by lifting your tongue off and exposing the chords in the lower holes. Mm -hmm. Blues does almost the opposite, right? You're down in those lower holes, which many beginners have difficulty with. You know, they're pulling the pitch down without intending to, especially on draw two. Um, so what I, one, I decided, okay, I'm going to start with second position. First position is going to be something else because when you think about it, most blues harmonica playing is played in second position. There's some second, there's some third, every rare once in a blue moon occasion, there's going to be something beyond those three positions. Um, so what I did was, um, and I'm trying to remember, I should have looked through the book. Um, <laughs> I put you on the spot now. <laughs> Well, it's okay. I have it here, actually. I've got both books. Plus, there's a British chromatic book that I've been teaching out of from uh, Jim Hughes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
people keep saying, oh, you should write chromatic harmonica for dummies, but um, well, the, the audience, unfortunately, just isn't, isn't nearly as big. Mm. And publishers are looking for, you know, magic bullets right now because yeah. book publishing isn't exactly in the best um, uh, shape. And I mean, I, I talk about what blues is, what the harmonica is, uh, and all of that stuff. And even, you know, how they're put together, the whole reed plate and covers and all of that stuff. Mm. Wouldn't believe what it took to get the, the illustrators to get that stuff right. Um, and then a bit about just the most basic stuff about music theory. And I try not to use terms like theory because it kind of frightens people. Mm. But, you, know, you need to know names of notes and stuff like that. And then really it's about breathing. Because that's something that people really don't look at necessarily to begin with. And I mean, your organic amplifier, you know, starts down here and is all the way out to somewhere out here. Mm. All right. So really just gently, deeply breathing. And then how to hold it, you know, how to get it in your hands. And um, then just some very basic um, chord rhythms. All right. And then articulation, you know. One of the things that I notice that beginners very often do is if you want to play something, uh, like if you want to repeat a note or even go from note to note, you know, they'll do something like, um, oh, where's that next hole? And they take it out of their mouth and look <laughs> at it. You know, they'll take their lips off and stop breathing between notes when all they really need to do is keep breathing and change hole. Or if you want to repeat the note, ah, ta, ta, or ka, 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 or something that's going mm. to uh, allow you to just momentarily interrupt that flow. You know, to me, that is the really foundational stuff. And it's the stuff that's so easily ignored. You know, people intuitively stop breathing, and they very often intuitively take it out of their mouth and even look at it, you know, like, mm. as if, gee, where do I find the next hole? And of course, you have to develop that blind man's muscle memory. Yeah. Uh, you know, and when we get to single notes, what I did was I just came up with a song where all you had to do is play draw four and blow four and accompany a vocal track, mm. you know, so it takes the pressure off. You know, you can stay in one place, just breathe in on the right, at, the, at the right time and breathe out at the right time mm -hmm. uh, and maybe use your hands a little bit. And then it just progresses from there. And it, it, it goes on to get quite sophisticated. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I really aimed for with both books and with everything I've written really is to offer something to as many levels as possible within the same work. I remember being in high school and um, being told that Shakespeare always wrote to the people down there in the gallery that wanted to see blood and guts and the people up there who were into, you know, classic Roman poetry and, and everything in between. Mm. And he succeeded in doing that. And I've always kept that in mind. So <clears throat> I've always written to, uh, tried to write to all levels. Mm -hmm. to the extent possible. The Shakespeare of the harmonica world, then? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if I'd put myself quite there. <laughs> at least trying to follow that principle of, uh, you know, uh, having wide appeal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it really works. I mean, the Dummies books, I, I've, I've got a few other kind of blues harmonica for beginners sort of books. And mm -hmm. um, a few pages in, they're trying to get you playing the blues scale or something that needs, you know, a couple of bends in it. And you sort of like, well, surely a lot of people are going to be put off straight away because that's going to be difficult, you know, and they probably can't even play single notes at that point, you know? So I kind of yeah. like that, you know, when I got um, your blues harmonica for dummies, I was, I was happy by how long I had to flick through before it even got to any of that stuff, you know? Yeah. And some people get frustrated for that reason, you know, and they get disgusted and put it down and write, <laughs> unpleasant comments on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I actually troll that from time to time and just respond to some of those sort of <laughs> things like, well, they didn't deliver the book on time. Therefore it's a terrible book or, you know, just yeah. irrelevant stuff. And unfortunately <laughs> people are not always uh, um, reasonable or clear about those things. Uh, it comes to the territory though. Yeah. And yeah, I, I mean, that the an opportunity to, because if you can show, that you understand why people are frustrated or whatever it is, you know, mm. instead of, you know, cursing back at them. You, um, I always think of the, the parable of the lost lamb. Mm. It was one of the Christian parables where, um, uh, you know, a shepherd has, I don't know, a hundred sheep 
and then he counts them and there's one missing somewhere and he goes out and searches for it. You know, you always go for the lost lamb. The thing they don't tell you though is this, that lost lamb has its wool all entangled in a bush. And when you try and pull that lamb out of the bush, it pulls on the wool and the lamb complains. <laughs> and, and you have to say, never mind, come on, we're getting you out of the bush. You know, you can't take personally that the lamb is unhappy about the pain of being rescued. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a funny thing, I think, especially in the age we're living in, um, there's a depersonalization and, and an anonymity, even if people are writing under their own name, that comes through the internet. I think, I think a lot of people wouldn't go up and shout abuse at you in the street, but they'll say something really horrible about your book or, or you know, for me, it's, you know, YouTube lessons, they'll, you know, w without a thought. Um, you know, and it's not that they're horrible people, it's just that they're, they're, getting, they're getting that out somehow and it feels um, legitimate because it's on the internet, you know? Yeah, yeah, and I, certainly you see that on Facebook, people, you know, insulting each other or making assumptions about each other, mm. you know, oh, you must be one of, you know, that sort of stuff. <laughs> um, and I always just try and stay neutral in tone and factual. Yeah, yeah. yeah. People, and people come around. Yeah. You know, most people are not terrible people. Mm -hmm. They may get frustrated. <laughs> yeah. You may become momentarily the target of that, but uh, yeah. you have to kind of roll with it, and let yeah. it roll off. So aside from, from the books, um, you're obviously a very versatile player. So I'd, I'd like to hear a bit about kind of your, your, the playing side of things. I mean, I don't know if you have a, how you'd class your playing, because as I say, you, you play lots of different styles. Yeah, I'm kind of a gadfly, I suppose. <laughs> um, in that, and I remember being about, I don't know, 14 or 15 years old and thinking, oh, I'd like to play this kind of music. Oh, I'd like to play that kind of music. And I realized, gosh, I'm all over the place here. <laughs> Can I even do that? all of those things? You know, you'd hear the, like, you know, Renaissance music uh, and think, oh, wow, that's great. And then hear blues over here or whatever it was. Um, and over time, I've managed to do at least some of those things. I'm, I'm just attracted to a lot of different kinds of music. Mm. Uh, but along with that, I mean, you have to one, have the technique to do whatever is required in that style of music and two, really get into that style of music and understand how it might be different from other things. For instance, um, Toots Tielemans, wonderful jazz chromatic player, um, you know, an amazing musician. But I've heard him try to play classical music. Mm. And classical music is a different animal from jazz or pop music. It has its own requirements for how you approach each note, practically. Mm. And when I heard him, now this was, mind you, on an album by a jazz pianist, Fred Hirsch, who used to be a regular member of Toots' band. Mm. And he would, from time to time, do an album of like, you know, Russian classical stuff in a jazz interpretation. Mm -hmm. Right. And classical harmonica players would listen to that and say, eh, he doesn't really understand it. And when I listened to it, I kind of could hear what they were, what they were uh, talking about because his way of articulating notes. Now, jazz tends to want to flow all the notes together. Mm -hmm. Whereas classical tends to give emphasis to each note and articulate each note and kind of make everything pop out. And then you phrase that by some way of subtly kind of blurring the lines between them. Douglas Tate, the wonderful English um, chromatic player, you know, kind of taught me a bit about that. Um, and so when you hear somebody like Toots come at classical music, even in a somewhat jazz-like context, without really knowing how classical mus musicians approach that, it means he's not really getting all of the flavor out of it. Mm. You know, so, I mean, I'm always kind of trying to be mindful of that. There are what are called performance practices in any style of music, even in any period of any style. You know, there are things that you do, things you don't do. You, there are ways of doing things. Um, so to really deliver something like that, you need to understand those things. On the other hand, I'm often mixing styles and genres. Um, I mean, one of the things that attracts me as a player is doing something that hasn't been done before. Mm. All right. I mean, and I'm not talking about, you know, revolutionary stuff, just something new, something that's maybe expressive of what I want to do as a musician. 
And one of the things I find a little dismaying, I understand why people do it. But we'll see, oh, uh, here's how to play this little Walter thing. Hmm. You know, and I think, oh gosh, that's 70 years ago. <laughs> you know, it's great music and it's very attractive to want to be able to do that. But gee, you know, let's, let's look at some newer stuff. You know, how do we get harmonica into the, you know, the latest hip hop? Mm. Uh, even though a lot of older musicians, you know, they just scoff at, you know, whatever is new. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, having been one of those younger people doing the new thing and then being one of those older people uh, among, uh, among those who scoff, who scoff, I guess, um, it's a little amusing at times. Mm. It's funny you, you mentioned hip hop because today I had an email from uh, um, some producer in, in Portugal, I think he was in, and um, uh, he, he was asking to sample a song that I wrote with, with a band. I, um, we're, we're not together anymore, but I had a band called the Rumble Strutters. And we did like 20s and 30s style stuff, jug band Ooh. stuff and jazzy bluesy stuff. But we, but we wrote our own stuff. So we wrote a song called The Axeman's Jazz, all, all about, um, there, there was a book about it recently. And, and it was about a, an axe murderer in New Orleans in the early 1900s. But he was a jazz fan. And um, he wrote a letter to the local newspaper saying, I'm going to be out this weekend with my axe. And he'd murdered people by this point, you know, and they hadn't caught him. Um, I'm going to be out this weekend. But if you're playing jazz music or if you're playing, you know, that style of music um, in your house, then you'll be spared. And, and the story goes that that, you know, almost kind of uh, propelled then the development and, and whatever <laughs> jazz, you know, at the time. But he was never caught. And you can read the letter online. Wow. Anyway, wow. we wrote a silly song called The Axe Man's Jazz, you know, um, play that jazz good and loud and you won't get an axe in your head, play that jazz good and loud, you won't, you won't be waking up dead and all that kind of silly stuff. And I got yeah. an email today uh, from a producer in Portugal asking if he could sample that for a, 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 a rap sort of thing and he sent me a little demo of it and all that. Um, and there's a little harmonica part that, that is in the sample. Um, huh. that I played on Chromatic that I, I, I can't really play the thing, but I just learned learned where the notes were sort of thing. Um, yeah. But wow. yeah, um, I, I completely agree that, I mean, I love Little Walter and I love all that old stuff. And um, it, yeah, I mean, that stuff is timeless in a way, but there's, there's no point trying to be Little Walter because there was only one of him. You may, you may as well be who you are um, and that's not going to be the same. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and helping people find their voice. Mm. You know, I mean, that's obviously we're here to teach the tools of doing what you want to do, but that's a whole other dimension, finding your own voice as a musician. Mm. You know? Yeah. And I think it, it, that often it isn't, um, I don't know if it isn't attempted, but it feels like there aren't that, that many harmonica players in the, in the grand scheme of things. Who, who have that distinctive sound. I, I don't know if we don't try enough or something. <laughs> well, I think there are several, um, but they stand out for that reason. Mm. Yeah. You know, if you look at somebody like, say, Peter Madcat Ruth, mm. right, who you can hear clearly that he came out of Sonny Terry's playing, you know, and he knew all of the classic blues guys, but he's taken it in his own direction. Mm. My first acquaintance with him, actually, I was um, in music school and the jazz arranging teacher said, hey, look, I've got this Dave Brubeck album and there's a harmonica player on it. And it was, mm. it was, it was Peter mm. back in the 1970s. You know, and it's like a very strange combination of things. <laughs> but, you know, he's one of those people who is open to doing all kinds of different and strange things. He plays mm. in 5-4 and all of these odd time uh, signatures, partly, I guess, as a result of having worked with Brubeck. Mm. Um, and well, of course, Howard Levy is the obvious shining example. Mm. Uh, again, someone who uh, has done things that everyone thought was impossible. Mm. Uh, but he's a force of nature too. I don't know if you've ever met him. Yeah, yeah. I so I lived in Canada for a year actually. So oh, I did? lived I lived in Toronto, and I saw him play in the jazz festival there, and met him after the show. And and I chatted to him uh, last week. I, we did a, a video interview like this. Um, oh, okay. So, so it was nice to chat. I mean, you know, he's, he's one of a kind. And um, he, I think it was his curiosity, his, um, 
you know, he was describing, I said, well, how did all this, how did this overblow revolution happen? You know, and he was just saying, well, I just had these things in my head that I wanted to play. And, and I thought, well, what if I do this? What if I try that? And sooner or later, I get a new sound and I go, oh, great. What if I do this? What if it, you know, and just kept yeah, yeah. going. <laughs> right, right. Well, I remember him telling me that he just figured that every instrument can be made chromatic. Why not the harmonica, well, the mm -hmm. diatonic? And I've heard him, I remember one time he was, when he was doing his um, thing with Bella Fleck back in the, in, in the 1990s, and he, at one point he pulled out one of these, you know, just a little penny whistle, mm -hmm. and he started playing Coltrane on it. <laughs> you know, he had all the little half fingerings. I mean, I can barely get a melody out of this thing. Uh, I just happened to have one lying there. Um, but I mean, that's the kind of musician he is. Mm -hmm. He finds everything that can be done with whatever it is he's got in his hands. Uh, and so, I mean, there, again, there's somebody, and his sound is, is unmistakable. Mm -hmm. You know, you can hear him use this background music on something or in a, in a, in a television commercial and say, oh, that's Howard. Mm -hmm. you know? I, I feel like there's almost a, I'm kind of, you know, saying this, saying this on the fly, I haven't really formed the idea yet, but I feel like there's almost a, a kind of a loop that, that if, if you go deep enough into an instrument, you kind of get into where you start, we will we'll start loving music and then, and you, you learn an instrument because you want to play music. And then a lot of us get to a point where we get obsessed with the, the instrument and the things about that instrument, you know, being really good at that instrument. And you almost have to push through all that stuff again and come back to this point of serving the music, serving the song again. Um, yeah. Once, you, once you've kind of got your grasp on the instrument. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Um, I often liken learning to uh, learning to play to driving a car, mm -hmm. right? I mean, once you can drive a car, it's like, I'm gonna go downtown. It's not, I'm gonna walk up to the car, unlock the door, take this hand, use the door handle, step in with my, you know, with one foot, sit down, you know. You could break down just getting into the driver's seat of a car into 20 steps. Mm -hmm. Right. And maybe at first you have to do that, or at least, you know, the stuff you have to do once you're sitting there and then have to start the car and get it moving. But once you have all of those things under your belt, it's just, you get in the car and go, right. <clears throat> you're not there to marvel at the fact that the car works. <laughs> uh, you, you know, you're there to just use it to, to get somewhere. And likewise, yeah. your instrument becomes like that. Yeah. You, know, you want to play something. Although, I think every instrument has things in it that yield musical results that are generated by the structure and technique of playing the instrument, mm -hmm. right? There are things that lie well on a particular instrument that don't lie well on another one. And there are things that will actually come out of an instrument as a result of how mm -hmm. that instrument interacts with the human body. Um, and those things become idiomatic to that instrument. Hmm. And I definitely do that with the harmonica. You know, there are things that you write on an instrument that are organic to that instrument, but may or may not transfer to another instrument. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's, it's not always about just sort of making the instrument the, the assumed platform for achieving a result that's beyond the instrument. It, it can go both ways. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think that's very true. And, um... You know, every every instrument sounds different, doesn't it? And on a on a very basic level, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you, you you can recognize different instruments by the timbre, but also there there are other things there are other things going on. Um, to go back to, uh, you talked about different genres and um, the the aspects of of the playing style that come with those. Do you have? a kind of somewhere that feels like home, a, a style of music that feels like, well, this is the way I play. Or are you very much a, a sort of a chameleon in that regard? I go in and out, certainly. I mean, blues is what got me started playing the harmonica. And that always has a, a feeling of home to it. Uh, it's probably the one thing that I, I always return to. Uh, for a while, I got very much into uh, traditional music, um, sort of branching out from whatever informs Canadian traditional music, which is largely Scottish, somewhat Irish, somewhat French, 
And then there's this mysterious other component that comes in from partly from Native American uh, adaptations to the music, uh, and partly just a whole panoply of other things that, that seem to have influenced music over time. Um, and I still go back to that, but the harmonic sophistication of jazz, where it overlaps with blues, is probably the place that I always kind of am magnetically drawn to. Mm -hmm. Now, I always want to be a little bit more harmonically sophisticated. Well, I, in the middle of saying that, I thought about um, some of the blues guitarists and singers. One of the things that's fascinating me right now is songs that don't have chord changes, but sound like they do. <laughs> right? Because there's a lot of like old blues and even sort of bluesy gospel, where if you hear later musicians, especially like young white rockers, play a song, they're going to put the chords that they imagine are there into how they play the song. Mm. You go back and listen to Mississippi Fred McDowell or one of those old time players. And you realize they're playing that all on one chord. But the ear so much wants that other chord to be there, that it fills in that space. And to me, that's kind of fascinating. I mean, you, you definitely hear like 12 bar blues that have no chord changes. Mm. Right, uh, and you hear that it's just one chord, but you can hear the phrasing that goes with a twelve-bar structure. But then you also hear songs like, um, well, for instance, um, well, nobody's fault but mine comes up. But I was thinking maybe a more familiar example might be "Swing Low, Sweet Chariot." Mm -hmm. Now that was first written down in the late nineteenth century. We actually know who composed it. And there's a whole story behind that, which I won't get into. If you, you know, look it up if you want to. Um, if you think about when the saints go marching in, right, it's that same form. I call it saints changes just because that's the most familiar form of it, although mm -hmm. it clearly existed before that song did. You know, when the saints go marching, five chord. Mm -hmm. How I want to be in that four chord when the one to five to one, right? Mm -hmm. All of that stuff's going on in the Saints, and the various earliest recordings have all of those chord changes. But if you listen to uh, something like, um, or you actually even look at the sheet music for um, um, Swing Low Sweet Chariot, the only time there is a chord change is at the very end, where it goes mm -hmm. five, one, just to kind of give that into the verse. Mm -hmm. Everything else is implied. You know, they actually wrote it out in four part vocal harmony for the, um, uh, I'm blanking on the name of the, it was one of the, hist what they now call the historically black colleges. Mm. Colleges and universities that were specifically established in the late 19th century mm. for African Americans because they couldn't get into the otherwise white universities. Uh, the Fisk Jubilee Singers. You know, and they went on tour to raise money. Uh, and at first, they weren't doing all that well. And somebody came to them and said, hey, I've got some better songs. I know this guy who wrote Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, and a couple of other things. And that's how that song got famous. But so there are a lot of these tunes out there that imply chord changes when they're not there. And that to me is very fascinating, you know, because there's always the temptation to fill in and add all sorts of things. You know, mm -hmm. jazz players tend to do that, make things very harmonically sophisticated. So uh, what, what, uh, what are they doing? What's happening to imply those changes? Often it's focused on a note, right? If you go to the fifth note in the scale, right, that's such a strong note that its chord members just kind of all start saying, hey, include me. <laughs> you know, and the, you know the, 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 something about the musical mind hears that and uh, fills in the, the details that aren't actually there. You know, because if you listen to what's going on in the guitar or in the, uh, the other singers, they're still singing the one chord. Mm -hmm. But the mind wants to fill in that detail of the five chord or sometimes the four chord. Uh, so uh, to me, that's kind of fascinating. Yeah, I think it is. And I, I kind of, um, I think that it's really sad. It's tragic when, when anyone says I'm not musical. Um, you know, I, I just, I don't have a musical bone in my body because I think we've all got instinctive 
musicality in us and and it like you say with with hearing a certain note that sure someone who's educated musically might be able to tell you what's happening there but on a more instinctive level a complete novice might be able to hear it um and i think i think it's in one of your dummies books or you know you've seen it other places but talking about um you know the most basics of uh, fundamentals of music and th things like an octave interval and the fact that if you sing a note and get a man to sing it and then get a woman or a child to sing it they'll sing it in different octaves and there's kind of that musical th there's something that we we get that we you yeah. know most people couldn't tell you what was happening there but they'd be they they could sing that note and they might not even be singing it in the same octave and there's somehow that we kind of get that and i think that if we can keep encouraging people to tap into their musicality you know it, it's possible for everyone right yeah i think it's there i i seriously doubt that anyone is actually tone deaf as they claim mm -hmm. people generally they can hear melodies they can hear if a melody's wrong right so that tells me they're not tone deaf it's just that they haven't used their own personal apparatus to cut to, mm. to to find the notes mm. i mean i have run across people who genuinely don't have um <clears throat> uh let's say a developed sense of rhythm mm. right and you have to say okay we're going to count and don't wait for the for the beat right mm. you have to be walking right beside it mm. not kind of following behind mm. <laughs> Uh, I have a student right now. I'm kind of working with that, and he and he's, he's having some success. Mm. You know, but I really had to focus on that. Um, yeah, I think often it comes down to the, someone who has maybe practiced that, or maybe finds it easier to to keep the beat. Ends up saying, "You need to feel it. You just need to feel it." You know, and I think there's truth in that. But if someone isn't, um, you know, that that doesn't necessarily always make sense to them. You know, they're going, well, how do I feel it? How do I feel it? I like yeah. that walking alongside it. That, I think that's a good way of describing it. I've not heard it described that way before. Yeah, well, I kind of came, came up with it for him because he, he would definitely wait until he heard it and then he would try and match it, but it was always a, that delay. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm always looking for metaphors that will help people understand things. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I, I, I'm often talking about learning to trust your ears rather than your eyes um because your eyes aren't going to help you musically you know and it's the same whether you, you mentioned people wanting to they take the harmonica away and and it, it's um it's a shame really that the the holes on a harmonica are numbered because people then want to look at the numbers you know um right. and it's the same with a metronome you know they kind of want to watch that you know moving and it, you know they're, they're not kind of really listening yeah that's yeah, true Although now with, with all these metronome apps, mm. you know, you, you don't get this. Yeah, well, yeah. Actually, actually, some of them do do it visually on screen. Yeah. So, you know, listen to it. You know, your ears are what's important here. Yeah. So you mentioned a, a student of yours. Are you doing a lot of private teaching? I, yeah, I, I do a fair amount um, uh, of individual teaching. I don't really do a lot of class situation stuff, and maybe I should. Um, but my experience doing that in person, you know, with a class of maybe 10 people is people are at such different levels, you know, and they all need individual guidance in different ways that it becomes difficult to, to do a class as opposed to sort of juggling, you know, 10 private lessons in the space of 90 minutes or whatever it happens mm -hmm. to be. Uh, no, I, I enjoy teaching very much. Um, and you play uh, chromatic and diatonic. Do you... Do you play any of the kind of altered tunings of diatonics or are you a Richter kind of guy? Um, I default to the basic tuning, but I do use other tunings. In fact, um, do you know about the Magic Harps? I don't think so. They sound fantastic. Nope. Well, you know who Magic Dick is, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've met Magic Dick when he was in okay. London, yeah. Well, Dick lives in Massachusetts and there's another player in Massachusetts who's not as well known, a guy named Pierre Beauregard. Hmm. And evidently he's descended from a Confederate general. I think he's Pierre Beauregard the fourth or something. Um, and he's a great player. And the two of them came up with a series of altered tunings and actually patented them. 
in the early 1990s. And with the view that Honer or somebody would produce these commercially, which never happened. Um, and I knew about these tunings. I mean, I, I, somewhere I have like a cassette tape out from my answering machine with Pierre just enthusing and almost ranting for about an hour and a half of <laughs> playing the various tunings for me over the phone, you know, 20 some odd years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in the fall of 2018, five of these custom built by Jimmy Gordon and one of the Felisco system customizers, um, Felisco Guild, had built these for somebody and they were up for sale on eBay. And Jason Ritchie said, hey, let's get these. And I said, you go ahead. <laughs> And uh, about a week later, I was in New Orleans where we were teaching at the Harmonica Collective, and he dumped these out on a table and said, here, figure these out and let's sell them. <laughs> so I did. You know, I, the, the, that stuff's easy for me. I don't think he has the patience to do it. Uh, and, uh, and we did sell most of them, but I kept one because it was the strangest one. Now... <laughs> Every successive note is four steps up in the scale, right? Now, chords are usually built by going three steps up in the scale. And then to leap to the octave of that first note, then you, gotta, you, you, you go up a fourth. But this is all fourths except for one place where the pattern repeats. And the draw chord is the same chord, just starting in a different place. I was like, why did they create such a strange tuning? Uh, eventually, what I figured out was this. There's one note that sticks. It's actually a, a pentatonic scale. And because of that one place where the pattern repeats and you get a third, there's a... Like holes one, two, three on this, or actually like draw one, two, three on a regular harp. And, but if you go two, three, four, you get a minor chord. going back and forth between major and minor. So I got really fascinated with this and I've, I've, I've written some tunes around it. Um, there's one on my YouTube channel, uh, Soulagement, which is using that actual harmonica. But then I started having them built in different keys and then using Brendan Power's switch harp yeah. to connect two of them in different keys. And like I was doing C and E flat, and this one is like uh, B flat and D. So you get all these odd combinations and really cool sounding chord progressions out of it. Um, in fact, the most recent thing that I put up called uh, Morning All Around Us is played with that, going back and forth between these two pentatonic scales and strange sounding chords. So I do get into alternate tunings. And as you can probably tell, I do it largely for chordal reasons. Mm. Right? Like often when people create an alternate altered tuning, they'll say, oh, now you can play this scale or you can get this bend. Right now, of course, I check all of that stuff out. But for me, the first thing I do when I pick up an alter tuning is say, "What kind of chords does it play?" Because mm. to me, that's that offers so much that you you won't get out of a standard tuning. I mean, you can make any harmonica chromatic, mm. you know, with bends and overblows and so forth, or you can just pick up a chromatic and you've got to read for every note. Um, so that to me is a little less fascinating than what a harmonica can do chordally. Yeah, I mean, I've never heard anything like that. That that was fascinating. Just just hearing that little bit there. Um, but yeah, because that, that's true, truly different. Um, I completely agree that, as you say, you can make any harmonica chromatic. So it's it's not, it's no longer exciting to hear those notes, and and it and and actually to to hear different chords on a harmonica. It's it's kind of like whoa. Uh, it feels like a new universe because you just wouldn't usually hear those because you know you you wouldn't be able to combine those notes at the same time right well one of the things that's really fascinating about the harmonica is that 
any harmonica structure in terms of combinations of notes is completely arbitrary. Mm. Right? I mean, if you get a, a, a tube like what's used in all other wind instruments, you physically have to vary the length of the tube by pressing valves or opening up, you know, whatever it is, like on a saxophone or a trumpet or a slide on a trombone. You're basically altering the, uh, the fundamental frequency of the tube, right? That's a physically imposed system. With a harmonica, you can put any combination of reeds in any sequence you want. Um, and so it's completely arbitrary because each reed is tuned to a note. It's funny, um, Honor actually has a sort of a semi-secret website where you can order alternate tunings in a variety of instruments. <laughs> right. And they warn you, we don't care if it makes sense or not. It's up to you to give us what you want. <laughs> we accept no responsibility if you, know, if you did something crazy because, hey, it's, it's your ball game. And it really is. You know, you can, you know, you could, you could put, you know, a low E from like a bass guitar next to the, you know, the high F of a, you know, high F harp. And if that's what you want, that's what you get. It's possible, it's possible to do. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited to go and check out the, um, the song you mentioned. I'll, I'll put a link to it in the video description as well. So people can listen to that and I'll be keeping an eye on your, your YouTube channel as well to, um, to hear some of that stuff because that's really exciting to hear. Yeah. Um, are you, in, in terms of performance, um, what, what are the groups you're, you're playing with at the moment? Is it your own band? Are you playing with other groups? Well, nobody at the moment, but... Um, well, yeah. <laughs> well, no, it's funny. I, I'm, I'm in a har harmonica quartet that I mentioned, and our bass player keeps saying, gee, I wish we could get together and rehearse, and then she'll pull up these these pictures of like these sort of little isolation tents, <laughs> right? We would get four of these and we set them in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> so we can actually play together. Uh, well, we'll see. Uh, actually, I was just starting to get back out into the gigging scene when all of this stuff, just the curtain came down. Uh, and I'd been hired to, um, this it's called hosting, but it's really more like being the, the, the featured act at a, a local blues jam where you have an hour set featuring a particular performer and then they open it up to whoever wants to jam mm -hmm. and and that that went well and then the uh the keyboard player said oh i've got this other gig i want to hire you for and the, and the guy who was running the jam says oh i'd like to book you again in a month or two and of course all of that's out the window now um i'd spent a long time well a uh, better part of two years caring for my my girlfriend who eventually died of, of brain cancer so i was just kind of out of the scene completely because we'd actually been performing together i was a violinist um, and uh, in fact, there's some stuff of, of, of hers and of us on, on my YouTube, YouTube channel as well. Um, so I was kind of getting back out into the scene and well, that'll continue at such point as it's possible to, to continue. Yeah. Uh, I, I really like performing, just hadn't been doing a lot of it until, until recently. So to, to finish, um, I suppose, I'm not sure exactly what my question is, but um, okay. <laughs> I suppose, you know, you started talking at the very start a bit about SPA and you talked about the way it, it um, maybe was at the start and then your involvement in it. And you've talked about the need for uh, ingenuity and, and creative um, variety. Um, so I suppose my question is, what do you see in terms of the future of the harmonica? Um, maybe what do you hope might happen with the harmonica in the future? Well, um, I would hope that it continues to attract players. Now, when I first, and speaking of spa, when I first started going to spa, let's just say my hair was a different color. <laughs> right? And I was one of the, the young guys saying, hey, we got to shake things up around here. You know, now I look around and think, Gee, I'm one of those old guys. You know, hopefully, hopefully with a better attitude. Uh, and one of the things that happens now, of course, with people who play harmonica not as their primary uh, activity in life, is uh, they'll come in maybe as a teenager, right? And we have a youth scholarship program at the Spa Convention, you know, and they're maybe really good players and enthusiastic and all of that. And then they go off to university, and then they start a career. And they start a family and they're buying a house, you know, all of those things. And we don't see them again until they're 
45, maybe 50 years old, mm -hmm. right? And that's just kind of the way of how things work in most people's lives, I think. Um, <clears throat> so there's that factor. But then on the creative side, you know, for people who are actually playing, it's interesting that the harmonica definitely attracts some people. Hmm. Now, when I think about young players, there aren't that many of them out there, but then I'm not sure there were all that many of them to begin with. Um, I mean, harmonica has gone through periods of really strong popularity, right? I mean, Honer claims that at the beginning of the 20th century, they were shipping, you know, in the tens of millions of harmonicas. Hmm. Um, and I think a lot of them ended up in sock drawers, you know, uh, and in some parts of the U.S., you know, you can go around and find at estate sales uh, pre-war harmonicas with a little star on them or really good bass harmonicas and chord harmonicas that people maybe never played very much. That's sort of how I got mine well, through an intermediary because uh, I do play a little bit of chord and bass as well. Mm -hmm. um, not super well, but you know, well enough to make little demos. When I um, when I write an arrangement for, and I know I'm getting a little off topic here, when I write an arrangement for uh, Tim Sandwich, I always make what I call the puppet orchestra uh, recording, which is just a demo recording so they can hear what it sounds like. So then I have to pull out the bass and pull out the chord and mm. play at least well enough just to get through the parts. Um, it seems though that during the early 20th century, the harmonica did attract a lot of young people. It was marketed to young people very much. And in some ways that's kind of hurt it because it's been seen as a child's toy. You know, anybody can play it, all that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> and I think at a, a certain point that probably was seen as being a cool thing for a young person to do. And the 1950s kind of, somebody's ringing. Oh, him. Okay. Well, I'll talk to him later. Uh, <laughs> one of my more unusual students. Anyway, um, where was I? Oh yeah. In the 1950s, what you see is the electric guitar killing off the saxophone, the accordion, and maybe the harmonica, right? It kind of dominated the landscape. Mm. And then the harmonica started to come back in the 60s for a variety of reasons, partly because of people like Bob Dylan, right? And people have strongly diverging opinions on the quality of his harmonica playing, but he certainly put it in front of people. Right, and then you get the whole sort of hippie revolution and people wanting to do all of that stuff. And the harmonica can, kind of came along as part of that. At the same time, you get blues moving out into the younger white audience, you know, and older black folks just saying, okay, we're done with that. We're, you know, we want to listen to other music. Mm -hmm. um, and you had this sort of transference with the blues. So those are the things that really have driven the harmonica since maybe 1962 or so, you know, and, and rock bands too, you know, the Rolling Stones, Beatles, all of those sorts of people. Uh, in fact, that's really how I first started to play, is that I would hear the little dribs and drabs of, of harmonica, largely from British bands, actually, Spencer Davis Group or Cream or the Stones, people like that, saying, oh yeah, okay, and, you know, picking up a harmonica and starting to play that way. And then you discover what's behind all of that. You know, maybe first but Butterfield, Muscle, Muscle White, and then, oh, gee, there's these other guys that they learned from. And, you know, you just keep going back and back to the, uh, the, through the mists of time, practically. Um, I'm not sure that that model holds up for a wide variety of younger people now, right? Mm. That's a long time ago. It's funny because when I was a child in the like the 50s and 60s, I would hear my parents talk and, you know, and their friends talk about the Great Depression, you know, or the Second World War. Mm. And to us, it was like ancient Egypt, right? We might as well have been talking about, you know, the Israelites going across the Red Sea to escape the Egyptians. Mm. It seemed that far away in time to us, you know, and I... Now, if I think back to that formative period of mine, well, it's, it's equally as far away for younger people. So I guess my question would be, what's going to motivate younger people to want to play the harmonica? Mm. Yeah. Because it isn't a big part of the pop landscape right now. Yeah. And I think that the whole um, idea of a pop landscape has, has changed somewhat because... Of course, there there were there were people there were there were superstars there were pop stars in the sixties. But th there's something about 
now, especially with, with YouTube and Instagram and, and all that, that it's fame for fame's sake. And kids say, I want to be famous when I grow up. Not even I want to be a pop star. It's just, it's the fame first and, and the music a poor second, if anything, you know. So there's kind of a, there's, there's been a, a switch um, that, that I think it is really intense at the moment. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with it. I think at the end of it, we're all human and we all want yeah. connection and, 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 you know, that thing of we, we have music in us. So I'm hoping, and who knows what something like what's happening at the moment with us all kind of stuck at home, who knows what changes it's going to mean for society. And, and I think we'll want to get back to our roots at some point. So kind of quietly yeah. hopeful. I think you have to be, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. But the other thing I see is that music is no longer being made by playing instruments necessarily. I remember being um, home for in Canada for Christmas a few years back, and my nephew was going out to some music event, you know, held in at a gigantic venue, mm. and it was all DJs. Mm. You know, you go to a dance club. Is there a band? No, there's a DJ. And I mean, they're doing sometimes a marvelous things of, you know, making one thing flow into another, right? But it's a completely different art using, a, well, I'm obviously they're using music that somebody made, mm. right? But they're recombining existing stuff. Mm. You know, and when things get to a certain level of content availability, that happens. Mm. People will make pastiches out of already sophisticated stuff. I mean, how does your phone work? <laughs> Most of us, you know, how many of us even have a clue how our phone works, yeah. right? There's a wonderful uh, quote from, I think it was uh, Joseph Campbell, the, you know, the guy who's into explaining mythology. Um, Sufficiently advanced science is indistinguishable from magic. I think I've heard that at some point. Yeah, yeah that sounds well, familiar. Right. And I mean, that's what DJs are doing. I mean, in a sense, they're taking stuff that's already been created at a very high level. Now somebody has to do that creating hmm. and maybe they do it with, you know, with a keyboard and synthesizers, or maybe they do it, but I mean, even that takes skill just to play a keyboard, hmm. right? I'm not, I'm not knocking that in the least. Um, but the, the execution skill of being able to play an instrument is not the same as being able to take an app and, you know, flow stuff together. Hmm. Right. I mean, that, that's a skill too, but it's a very different kind of a skill. So the creation of music that people perceive as a consumable may not be created, at least at that level of perception, by picking up an instrument and learning to play it. Yeah. You know, so I, again, I kind of wonder where the actual playing of musical instruments that make notes come yeah. out, yeah. you know, what, what place that's going to have. <laughs> well, maybe, the, maybe, maybe, Society will crumble to the point where we have nothing and uh, and we all have to start by, you know, uh, a stick and, a, you know, a cow skin and, and start, you know, start making drums that way again. And who, who knows? Um, but we'll, we'll, you know, we'll find out or the next generations will find out. <laughs> well, it, it could very well happen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, let's, let's, uh, let's hope that, that um, the harmonica continues and, um, thrives thrives again in the future um and i think that's uh, rather rather strange but but good place to stop um, <laughs> okay. I, I, right. I i really appreciate you you taking some time out to chat with me it, it's been uh, really fascinating and um yeah great great to hear all about everything you're doing yeah well, thanks liam thanks for having me in. you're very welcome thanks winslow take care all right you too bye